success is I get to wake up every day and go to work and be excited about what I do. Yeah. That's success. Yeah. And so if my clients can wake up every day and just be able to be them and move through their day as them with their challenges, with their successes, with their failings, with everything, but be able to do it, mm -hmm. that's a success for me. Yeah. I really appreciate you joining us. Either work or Why is this happening? What does the child need to express themselves? How can we help understand them? Here's a way to look at autism in which your child is not a problem that needs to be yes. fixed. That's that shift in language that's so important. Yeah. Hello everyone, welcome to our first ever episode of Feeling the Love with Big Heart Toys, our newest podcast series. We are going to be speaking with Christine McInnes today. She's a licensed family and marriage therapist and she's going to be talking to us all about autism, neurodiversity, and debunking myths. So let's dive in. Yep. So we've talked about how autistic burnout is different than maybe what we mm -hmm. believe burnout mm -hmm. is, period, right? Yep. And I'll get pushed back on that one. See, these are the ones where people get really stuck. Burnout's burnout. It all looks the same. Sure. No. <laughs> Because when someone is traditionally burned out and is aliastic, again, the terminology mm -hmm. that I'll, I'll, I will give to our, our listeners is aliastic person is anyone who does not identify as autistic. Okay. And that could be self-identification or diagnosed by a professional. Mm -hmm. um, and so aliastics, they don't struggle with some of the same tasks that someone, that an autistic person would. And so, yes, they may suffer from burnout from doing the same repetitive activities or being in a job that's exhausting to them. So it's similar in that regard because it's exhaustion is really mm -hmm. what burnout is. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a full exhaustion with whatever the process is. Yeah. However, they don't have the added layer of masking all day. They don't have the added layer of trying to fit into societal norms. Mm -hmm. They already do. Mm -hmm. So their burnout is usually cured pretty easily. Mm -hmm. They take a break. They stop working for a bit. They go on vacation. Right. And that refreshes. They come back and they're able to do it. Autistic burnout is severe. It, it mimics depression. And so a lot of times it gets diagnosed as right. such. Mm -hmm. And then people are put on SSRIs and other medications. And it masks that. And so when you're talking about autistic burnout, it can go awry really quick. Mm. And the marker really is checking in with how often do you have to mask? Mm -hmm. And when you dive into, I'm thinking of a specific client, when you dive into the environment they're in, and if it's really toxic to an autistic person where they're not getting affirmed, they're not getting supported, their behaviors are constantly criticized, mm -hmm. it leads to a complete shutdown. And the only recovery is taking a month off from everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's that's my prescription for mm -hmm. everybody. And it's taking a month off from any demands that are not you driven. Mm. You want to go to the gym every day? Great. You want to get up and work on a project that you're really excited about? Great. Right. But trying mm -hmm. to go do the thing that you were constantly being criticized for doing, mm -hmm. you're never going to get better. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it means a permanent change in your environment. Yeah, and I hear you saying, take a month off. Right? Does capitalism mm -hmm. allow taking a month off? No. <laughs> no, it does not. Yeah. So here we are with this dilemma yeah. again mm -hmm. that we're assuming people should be working 24-7, yeah. you know, and take Especially a two-week vacation. Too. Oh, it's obsessive. Yeah. I know. It's obsessive, this yeah. need for success and a need for achievement because... Let's be frank, it's yeah. real. We can't survive. Groceries at this point for a family of four, $200 for a week. Mm -hmm. That is an impossible need to meet. Yeah. You need to work. You need to work. Yeah. And so, what I usually do is, you know, say, okay, where can we find mm. the spaces then? Mm -hmm. And maybe it means canceling all social engagements if that doesn't affirm them. Maybe it means cutting back on work meetings, mm -hmm. telling the boss, look, I'm really struggling right now. I need to have some space. And this is where we need to start being accommodating in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And this is where training needs to happen for employers. Yeah. 
So it's a, it is it's a whole system shift that we have to start looking at. Yeah. And I see our young people fighting it. So we talked about masking. We talked about stigma. We talked about burnout. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I would love to ask you about your experience. Um, and I know you did you touched on that a little bit about, you know, how you how you felt that there was this handbook that everybody got. everybody got right I think that's a really cool metaphor to talk about mm-hmm. the way you know it might feel different um I'd love to talk about how you discovered this about yourself like where did this shift in your own experience start to change well I think in doing the work with my clients yeah. I would talk about healing mm-hmm. and I would say oh well that environment sounds really toxic perhaps this is a good idea to maybe look at shifting into a different space. This isn't gonna be helpful. Or Mm -hmm. talking about their childhood experiences and their trauma. Mm -hmm. Even having that come up. And me saying, wait a second, I have that. Wait a second, I have that. (laughs) Wait, oh my gosh, that was me too. And I think it was like an aha moment. Mm -hmm. And what was so healing for me, even in working with my clients, I could say, wait a second, you're not weird. You're not too much. You're not um, overwhelming or all the things that I was told. Mm. And I use this example. In second grade, I was put in a two, three classroom. I grew up in New York City. It was during, it was in the seventies. It was during a budget crisis. Schools were chaos. And I had a two, three classroom and I'm a December baby. So I was the youngest child in the class by almost two years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right? And so I will never forget it. I sat in a desk in the back of the room by myself with no one around me. Uh, the desk next to me had, had mimeograph sheets that the teacher would save. You know, it was like a storage area. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't my desk. Um, and I didn't have another peer next to me, I guess, because I talked a lot. Mm. I don't remember having any interaction with anyone else in the classroom. I was isolated and every report card under self, uh, what did they call it back then? Needs self, in, uh, self improvement or yes, needs. Yeah. Oh, there's a Room term for grow, it. Kind of like, yeah, I, I know. I it's know. escaping me right now, but that one was mm. always an N and, and a hard N. Yeah. I still have the report card. I still mm-hmm. look at it sometimes to remind <laughs> yeah. myself, you are not this person. Yeah. They defined you that way. Yeah. The last semester was, was actually a U and it was underlined in red pencil. Mm. I was the youngest child in that class. I received no supports. Yeah. I was ostracized from the very get-go, put into a back of the room setting, isolated from the class yeah. instead of supported. Yeah. And so that really stuck with me yeah. for a long time that that was inappropriate yeah. <laughs> on many levels. Right. And my parents didn't know. They didn't they didn't mm-hmm. understand. They knew I had a horrible year. They knew I was really upset. They knew I came home crying and they pulled me from public school immediately and, and into a private school that next year because of it it was it was a really difficult year Mm. and so I I do look at my own experience and say you know now knowing more about neurotypes and how they develop and what they look like Mm. and the strengths-based model using it for my own purposes I don't work for other people Mm -hmm. my pervasive demand for autonomy Mm -hmm. is me not wanting to have other people telling me what to do all day especially when I found some of those things that I was being told to do wrong Mm. or unacceptable Mm -hmm. or not helpful. Mm -hmm. And so I left working in education where Mm -hmm. I was for 20 years, pension job, Mm -hmm. security, Mm -hmm. all that. I walked away and started my own practice helping people with what I struggle with myself. Yeah. And so it's, yeah, creating your life around you and now realizing I get to teach others that they get to do it too. And it doesn't mean everybody quits and becomes a therapist. Uh, yeah, of course. But, but it does <laughs> yes, mean right. maybe quitting um, a really toxic university yeah. job and becoming a potter. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, there's, there's many ways to really show up in your strength and your gift that you probably didn't look at before because right. society said, well, that's not going to give you a living. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, that's really powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm really, I'm really glad we are able to get your perspective because I think 
like, okay, you know, you were just a kid and just a, and the littlest. We're trying to think about being the littlest oh, yeah. and being judged so severely yeah. for what I just was being me. Yeah. And I think that's what I want parents to hear. Look, mm. I'm really successful and yeah. happy. Absolutely. And I did it on my own terms, though. Yeah. I didn't do it doing what society told yeah. me to do or how to do it or what to do. Right. And maybe you would have gotten there faster if you're, mm-hmm. if we'd been, if we'd been affirming, supporting, affirming. Yep. Oh, and yes, all of it. Yes, all of it. I probably would be right. here, but twenty years ago. Sure. I didn't have to suffer as long sure. as I did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm glad I am. Yeah. You. <laughs> um. On that note. I want to ask you about neurodiversity affirming care because I think this fits in really well with take, please, mm-hmm. please take your time. Um, yeah, I think what you were just saying works really well with neurodiversity mm-hmm. affirming. Okay. okay. So yeah, let, this is a cautionary tale. Yeah. ABA therapy. Okay. Let's get into that. So traditionally to cure autism, and I'm, I'm saying all of this very um, sarcastically mm. because it really, every time I think about it, it makes me so sad mm. to think of children going through this, mm. um, was the, the preferred and you know seen as evidence-based, another sure. word that gets me a little crazy, as the cure. Mm. So you would take a child, you put them in a situation where you teach them aliasic behavior mm. and tell them this is how you're going to do it, you're going to shake hands, you're going to have eye contact, you're going to do all the things, but you're going to do them all day long, every day, and be a totally different human being, and we're going to punish you when you don't. Mm -hmm. That was old school ABA. Mm. So they've softened it now. Sure. Now ABA is, oh, we're going to reward you for doing these things that are against your nature and not who you are, and we're going to tell you you're great because you did them. So they call that more holistic ABA and it's so much better no it's not you are still expecting a child to become somebody they're not Mm. that is exhausting Mm. it is traumatizing it is absolutely horrific to me to imagine being told to be somebody different and so that would be what they would call non-affirming care okay (laughs) sure yeah so the difference now being is okay what supports do this individual need Mm -hmm. instead of trying to make you be this person you're not we're going to take the person you are we're going to celebrate it we're going to find the gifts that are within you Mm because everybody has them you are then going to capitalize on those and you're going to find the struggle areas what do you need to help you with that yeah there's so many amazing resources out there so one of the biggest issues for someone like me is procrastination Mm -hmm. so ADHD and procrastination are best friends and so I will tend to put off things that I don't like doing. For me, that's notes. I have to keep my clinical notes. Yes. <laughs> I keep little jot downs. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll, I'll jot down things in session, and then I have to transfer them to my electronic yeah. health record. Always the bane of my existence. So there's a thing called body doubling. Yes. Where I can call a therapist friend up, and I say, hey, you struggling with your notes? Yeah, me too. Let's do it together. And we hop online, and we're not talking. Yeah. We're just, we're both like doing this this parallel play kind of activity in order to get our work done. Mm -hmm. So there's an example of of affirming care versus the other way would be, you know, punishing yourself. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to go home from work until you do your notes or, you know, there'd be other ways of forcing yourself to do it that wouldn't actually give you the same yeah, I love how you Level called of. it parallel play. Yeah, it's parallel play for I love adults. That. Yeah, parallel play, <laughs> parallel work, parallel work. We can yeah. get it done together. <laughs> That's so funny. yes, it's finding the strengths. Like you said mm-hmm. earlier, it's a very strength based model. Yeah, and it's also affirming. Yeah, you should be tired after a long day of work. Yeah, absolutely. You had to do all this, this, and this. And then getting their whole system involved. Mm. So if we're talking about a teen, it's involving the parents. If we're talking about an adult, it's involving their friends, their partner, their their family system that's you know still supporting them. So it's it's getting everyone involved. It's making sure that everybody's on the same page. Mm-hmm. And that's the hard part because remember, if you're my age, 54, you're raised to believe everybody has to meet these certain milestones. Mm. You have to have success. If you don't, we have to fix it. Mm-hmm. Oh no, we have a problem. Instead of no, we have an opportunity to change it. 
So I think yeah. that's a, the best description. Yeah, can no, give of absolutely. That. Very, yeah, that's very and helpful. Very anti ABA, very anti behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. very um, much not expecting them to do things the way alleistic people would. Right. And I think, I think, um, for listeners, part of that is like things like repressing stimming or oh, right. stimming. We haven't even talked yeah, about stimming. I know. I know. We if you haven't been stimming. watching me play with my fan, I my know. fingernails the I whole know. time. So what is stimming? So it's so interesting because yeah. I'm sitting here like doing this yeah, and yeah, being yeah. very professional. Yeah. And it is driving <laughs> me crazy. When you said we could take a break, I'm like, oh. I know. Because <laughs> I will sit here and I will play with my fingernails. Yeah. And, and literally in online sessions, you'll see me from, you know, the, the you know, the neck up right. and I'll be fully engaged, but beneath the desk, I'm sitting have there something. playing, I have to be playing with something and it releases endorphins. It relaxes my nervous system. It makes me able to engage. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, things like stimming, they're not even so self-injurious behavior is also seen as, as so horrific. Right. It is literally a child just trying to get that feeling yeah. out of their body yeah. and they don't know what to do. And so instead of redirection, it's finding those things that will give them that feeling to get out of their body instead of just right. assuming that, that, that this is a problem. Right. Everything is seen as a problem rather than a solution. Right. And we can, for self-interest behaviors you're talking about, we can find a different, a different safer outlet, yeah. right? Like, right. It doesn't have to be... But it still can be it's, throwing yourself still, on maybe right. a soft mat soft instead mat. of the ground. Exactly, right. right. It's there, like a crash mat. We use exactly. that. Like, I've yes. seen OTs exactly. use that a lot. Like yep. crash mat. Trampolines. Yeah. Oh, there's just so many things that we can <laughs> yeah. do in order to help people yeah. with those things that they have to do to release that from yeah. their bodies. Yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. I think that's amazing. All right, so Christine, I would love to talk about your practice and what, Ooh, yeah, thing. absolutely. What do you do? So I'm, a, I'm actually the trauma therapist of our arm. Now I call it, because there's, there's three of us now. It used to just be me. I started out all by a little lonesome. It was just an, initially an LGBTQ affirming practice. That was my, you know, initial work that I was doing. And in that work, I started working with a lot of transgender teens, which was in, in kind of a small niche too in the area I was in. There was only one other woman doing that work locally. Her and I connected. There was very few resources. It wasn't talked about like it is now. This was in 2016. Okay, yeah. Very much, these people just got to live normal lives and be them and get medical supports and no one talked about it. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly it became a conversation in the whole general population, mm -hmm. which is fascinating to me because we're talking about a small group of people, yeah, <laughs> less than 1%. Right. Right. Um, and what's interesting is there's a huge overlap between transgender individuals and neurodiversity. And so I started seeing that intersectionality and then I'm like, your ADHD, your practice should probably focus a little on what you are too. Mm -hmm. And so I started bringing more of that in. And then the more, of course, I got into my hyper focus again. And I took that deep dive into what is autism for mm -hmm. transgender folks? It looks different. And I think this is a thing. And so that's really when I dove deep into this whole right. neurodiversity affirming way of being. Because again, my practice is focused on affirming therapy. Mm -hmm. And affirming therapy generally, it doesn't matter if it's LGBTQ, neurodiversity, it really is accepting an individual where they're at mm -hmm. and not expecting them to be a different person as a result of our work together. Yeah. I'm here to enhance their life and help them as a teammate to do that. I'm not here to fix anybody. Mm -hmm. No one needs to be fixed. We really don't. The things we think are wrong with us, sometimes, like I said earlier, are our biggest gifts. Mm -hmm. And so... That's the basis of my whole practice, is helping people recognize their, their innate talents, their innate gifts that have been covered up by years of people telling them otherwise, dealing with the trauma and the fallout of yeah. being different in our society, whether it's an LGBTQ person, whether it's a trans person, whether it's somebody who has a neurodiversity and they've been harmed all these years by mm -hmm. ABA, it, 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 it develops in all different ways. So I'm the trauma arm and I do EMDR, mm -hmm. which is a evidence-based oh yes yes we get to say <laughs> evidence-based practice mm -hmm. but what's fascinating about that is when I took my initial training mm -hmm. 
I didn't like it. I thought it didn't work. Oh, okay. The eye movements made me fall asleep. Yeah, so can you explain, what is? What yes, is, I will explain, yes, yeah, yeah, sorry, we'll back up a no, little bit. perfect, yeah. So EMDR, is, it's interesting because we need to reframe what it really is. Okay. It's really using bilateral stimulation, so doing something that, that goes both ways mm -hmm. in order to change the plasticity of your brain. Mm. So when a trauma occurs, it gets stuck in the prefrontal cortex and it creates a system-wide response, a nervous system response, and doesn't leave us. So when you talk about, say you were in a car accident that was mm. near fatal and you barely escaped, your body, anytime you hear of a car accident or see a car accident, might have an actual physical response as a result right. because of that trauma. What EMDR does is desensitize it. So it's eye movements, mm -hmm. which is originally how it started, was you followed someone's finger while you talked about the trauma mm -hmm. and then pro reprocessed it and desensitized mm -hmm. it. So that's basically the shorthand of what it is. Sure. So here I am in the training and my partner person, the therapist that worked, you know, we worked together to train, she's doing EMDR on an incident I had. And I just sat there thinking about my grocery list <laughs> and I was like, why do they think this is so good? I don't feel anything. I still feel traumatized thinking about what happened. Yeah. I'm not feeling better. Yeah. I don't like this. Yeah. And so at the break, we, it was online. It was during COVID. So at the break, I, I went to the trainer and I said, I don't like this. I, I think I'm going to leave. I, I think it's stupid. And she was like, oh, okay, tell me a bit about yourself. So I told her, oh, I have ADHD. Oh, and I also had a traumatic brain injury in 2016. I had a... Um, an, AVM or aventricular oh, malformation yes. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that blew and I had to have surgery so yeah. I said so I have that too so that maybe maybe that's why my brain just doesn't work for this for this product yeah. and, <laughs> and so she's looking at me like she's like I'm gonna give you to Eric so this other trainer in the group also was a, tra a traumatic brain injury survivor okay. and he laughed he said oh yeah you can't do eye movement your brain is is not gonna work that way your so brain is different yeah and I said, wait, you understand neurotypes? And he's like, oh yeah. And I was like, really? <laughs> and I got all excited, because of course here's somebody talking about my hyperfocus of neurodiversity. And he says, yeah, it's not gonna work. You have to modify. He's like, I do this for bilateral stimulation. Mm. And so I went back and tried it with the trainer person and instantly it worked. Wow. And I, I just was like, whoa, what did he just okay. teach me? Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized, mm -hmm. oh, if I'm going to do this with my population, yeah. who all have different brains, I'm going to have to change it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to modify it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to do it differently. And so what I started a whole process of, 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 in my training, when I was working with clients, doing different things, showing them the body movement thing that, he, that Eric Bromel taught me, mm -hmm. showing them, oh, wait a second, you can't visualize. That's right, you have aphantasia. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's a calendar with pictures of a calm, safe place, something we use for resourcing. And so I realized that there had to be all these adaptations. So I dove in deeper again, <laughs> got my certification yeah. from Andrea, the umbrella that oversees us. And then I started really adapting. And then I created a training for other therapists mm -hmm. on adaptations for autism and ADHD so that they could help their clients. Right. We're now a huge Facebook group of over 2,000 providers that are ND affirming EMDR, so it's very niche, very specific, right. but it's a practice that's growing. And I, watching it happen has been the most exciting yeah. part of my career yet. Yeah, and, and contributing to it too. <laughs> and the healing, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. fascinating mm -hmm. because so many people who are neuro, you know, neurodivergent would oh, say, yeah. oh, EMDR didn't work for me. And I'm like, the eye movements, right? And they're like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, eye movements. I, I don't think I've used eye movements for one client. Wow, how fascinating. That's it's just, it's, fascinating. Uh, yeah, and I don't think, I don't think necessarily everyone knows anything about no, this. No, no one knows anything like about whole, it. It's like a whole so, thing. Yeah, yeah. even other therapists thing. don't. Yes, absolutely. It's interesting yeah. when I talk to even other EMDR therapists, and it's growing though. Yeah. I'm, I'm very proud of Andrea. There was a lot of, I would say ableism about it, that, sure. that it wasn't needed to be changed, that sure. you could just have a specific protocol and it'd be okay. Now they're really embracing mm -hmm. it. They did ask me to do a blog spot on ADHD and EMDR. I was really excited about mm -hmm. that. So I think it's a growing, it's definitely a growing need and, a, and an understanding. How cool. It's so it's really, cool. Yeah, it's it is so cool. cool. It's so interesting. Um, 
So tell me a little bit about, I know you do, you work with um, a range of clients. Every client mm-hmm. is different. Every client is right? different. Absolutely. 100% different. So this makes it hard, but I would love if you would tell us what, what do sessions look mm-hmm. like when they, so you're a licensed marriage and family therapist, correct? Correct. Okay. So if someone goes to a therapist such as you, mm-hmm. what can they expect? What does a session look like? How do goals become, come into fruition? Mm-hmm. How, how is everything developed? Well, initially we have a case conceptualization. So the first couple sessions is getting to know each other mm-hmm. and finally realizing, oh, wait a second, I'm not weird. <laughs> so there's a lot of this, wait, you don't think I am. You don't think I am. No, I don't think you are. No, I don't think you are. But I was told by. There's a lot of the, the, the breaking down of the myths of what they're there to do. Right. Because they've been told by other providers they're there to relearn how to behave. They're there to... Um, except that there's something wrong with them and that it needs fixing. So I'm there. The first couple sessions is getting to know each other and demystifying what therapy really is in my room. Because in my room, it's finding those strengths. Mm -hmm. And it's also uncovering trauma because a lot of times it does kind of, it's hard to tell, right? Is this a trauma response? Is this something that happened to you? Or is this just daily living Mm -hmm. happening to you? Right. So sometimes there is real trauma, though, behind it. You know, parent abandonment, adopting. Like, there's there's so many different things that come up that you don't realize are traumatizing events that people don't even realize they were traumatized Mm -hmm. by. So a lot of uncovering of that. That would be probably our first couple sessions. Sure. And then, yeah, deciding what... And a lot of times people come in ready to go. Like, I want to work on this. Okay. And then we do a case conceptualization of how we're going to work on it, what it's going to look like, what therapy is going to look mm-hmm. like. Sometimes EMDR is utilized, but not always. Sometimes it's just talk therapy. And a lot of it's psychoeducation. Mm-hmm. And so psychoeducation means training people on what exactly is happening to them. Mm-hmm. because they just think it's something horrible. They don't understand the why. They don't understand the meaning. And so I go into a lot of um, education on what's happening to them right. and right. why. Right. And even that can be relieving. Yeah. And, you know, I'm thinking about this too. It's almost like I'm thinking of people who maybe were diagnosed later in life, right, mm-hmm. and maybe are feeling, you know, there might be the idea that, Oh, I you know I don't I don't want to have this label I don't want to mm-hmm. whatever X Y Z right um, and I'm thinking about the other side of that that's like freeing almost yes. like oh my gosh it's it's almost like a permission to forgive yourself yes. for like oh okay that explains a lot yeah, that you're not actually. weird right? that you're not strange yeah. that there's nothing wrong with right. you that you yeah. are who you are. Yeah. And, and that kind of bleeds into the, the work that I really love to do is family work. Yeah. So I will frequently get a family, and usually the young adult initiates it, mm-hmm. wants their parents to come in and talk about their experience growing up. And I genuinely, I'm always shocked to find that there is neurotypes going on all over the place. Sure. So, and, and it's interesting, you could be a, a neurodivergent person and still not connect with another neurodivergent person. Right. So frequently it'll be the parent has ADHD and the child has autism and the ADHD parent is constantly like this with them and the child's like this with them. (laughs) No, 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 thank you. So I I am kind of a translator of of sorts Mm. of explaining, oh, no, no, that's ADHD behavior and that's going to trigger your very introverted autistic child. You need to chill out okay so you're almost like you're helping communication mm-hmm. you're helping understand each other yep how how else does that process look uh, like it's so beautiful yeah because it's a lot of repair work yeah there's been years of miscommunication if you're talking about a 26 year old saying i need to have my parent come in i need to heal this relationship mm-hmm. there's a lot of repair work that has to happen yeah so you're talking adults adults who come in with yes. their parents yeah and this is it's yeah. kind of my micro niche if you will sure of, Families who are really, like, one child is not speaking to their parent. Wow, yeah. Because the miscommunication has gone on so long. Yeah, yeah. And once I start to untangle it, it's beautiful because they start to connect again. 
and then they don't. <laughs> and then we have a session on that. And so it really is, it's a retraining of, of what communication can look like mm-hmm. once we understand the neurotype and what's happening. Sure, right. And so I'm thinking your practice is all about healing, right? All it's about all healing. about healing, everything that you do. Um, and I'm thinking, how do you measure that? It's so interesting. <laughs> It's, it's literally, this is how I know it's done. Yeah. The client comes in and we start talking about the latest reality show uh-huh. or whatever their hyper focus is. Yeah. And we're just like, go off on tangents about it. And I'm like, you realize this is, this is just fun now, right? And they're like, yeah, I'm having a lot of fun and I just like hanging out. And I'm like, do you want to keep paying me to hang out? Yeah. And they're like, nah, not really, I guess. And I'm like you know you're good. And they're like, yeah, I'm good. Can I come back in if I need to? And I'm like, of course you can. So it's really measured in the fact that people are feeling successful again. Mm -hmm. And I use that word so specifically because I said it about myself earlier. Successful is not, I'm not rich. I'm not driving, you know, a a $70,000 car or living in a mansion. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I have enough to provide for my family. I have a pay what you can practice so people can come in and they can pay what they need. So again, I don't, it's not about wealth for me. Success is I get to wake up every day and go to work and be excited about what I do. Yeah. That's success. Yeah. And so if my clients can wake up every day and just be able to be them and move through their day as them with their challenges, with their successes, with their failings, with everything, mm-hmm. but be able to do it, mm-hmm. that's a success for me. Yeah. That's- so that's the goals. And that's how I measure it. That's no perfect, beautiful. I mean, it, it is, yeah, because it's no like check, 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 no. check. It's not like a little yeah. List and that's of what our things. medical model wants I us know, to do. Right. And that's why insurance is so frustrating. That's why I don't work with insurance. I know. Because right. I don't want to have to diagnose you and give mm-hmm. you a treatment plan. And I do treatment planning, but my treatment planning wouldn't be evidence based and yeah. you know all the things that More the, the, dynamic. The, it's dynamic, yeah. and that's not what insurance companies sure. like to reward. So. Sure. That's yeah. why I do pay what you can. Yeah, I'm sure it's going to be very hard. For it's sure. so frustrating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So I, I think just the whole concept of your practice sounds Aww, beautiful. I and love it. It's yeah. No, I love it. it. Yeah. No, I'm so lucky. I, yeah. I have an employee who does assessments, and she is a neurodiversity affirming assessor. So she's a, an educational psychologist, and she sees you know the anybody who needs to be assessed up to age twenty two. Okay. So that's for people who are looking for something a little outside the box. Yep. Not a traditional school assessment that they can get for free. So it's and, and she also does them for school districts that need that overflow. Sure. Work. And she's right. in high demand. They constantly are yeah. asking for her. She works. She works very much with children. And she just works with our children. Yes. She's like my children Adolescents. are adolescents. Mm-hmm. I get a referral for teens. I'm like Krista. I got a new one for you and she's gets, she loves it oh that's awesome yeah. yeah and so I know I know that that's her um her area yes and you are with adults right can you tell us a little bit about like for parents who are curious mm-hmm. how the assessment process might work a little bit or you know yeah I mean I can give a little bit I'll admit it's out of my scope of practice totally which yeah. is you know it, it's a real thing we want to be careful that yeah. I'm not talking at a, at a turn about Absolutely. what I don't do but she has kind of talked me through it. Yeah. A lot of it is is it, it looks like play. Mm. One of her one of her kits that she uses for assessments is a big box of toys. Yeah. And they literally sit and play with them, and she just uncovers neurotypes. Mm-hmm. That's really all it is. It's mm-hmm. not giving this like. And the diagnosis can be used though for especially like if she diagnoses a college student, for example, sure. they can bring it back to the disability department and say, I need these accommodations. Right. And that's important. We want right. those kids to be able to have the supports they need. And those supports can be as simple as one client I had could not, that they were so upset by um, any violence. Mm-hmm. And so like their history class was going to show a war movie and they were like, I, I can't watch that. Mm-hmm. And so it's things like that because of their hypersensitivity they might not be able to sit through that movie. Sure. And so they need to be able to be excused and read a transcript or something to yeah. get the same information. Yeah, so it sounds like it's very valuable. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and even working with the much younger population. Yeah, all the way down to two. Right, yeah. right. And, fi- and so I'm wondering, again, I know this is not your... <laughs> I'm wondering, um, how does... How does 
trauma and everything work for for such a young age group you know what is what is it focused on I guess what is the practice uh, the goal of the practice mm-hmm. there it's more again because they have to survive in a school system sure her job really and that's her license is specific to school so okay. she does not work with and we'll get into my third person that works for yeah. me that does kind of a mix of it all So she doesn't do the trauma-related work. She does the how do I get you to survive school Mm -hmm. is really her whole practice model is she's the school-based person. So they're refusing to go to school. They're struggling with bullying at school. They're having trouble connecting at school. That becomes her kind of a way of supporting our kids. Very important. I think that's helpful for families to know Mm -hmm. too that that's out there and that's a a possible resource that could be helpful. Right. Right. Something to keep in the back of your mind, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so what about the third person? And then I recently hired an amazing woman who came as a military spouse. She moved to California and California now has a program that military spouses, if they are licensed in another state, can be provisionally licensed here in California. I did not know that. To support them in moving oh, around the country, which is so yeah, nice yeah. for our military because they do so much for us. How cool. And so she's the very first one. And <laughs> I was like, I'm hiring a celebrity. Wow. <laughs> so she's she's an independent contractor who does like her own thing. She's licensed herself. And she's also an EMDR certified therapist. Mm-hmm. And so she has, she'll work with teens and adults. So she does like kind of the trauma work with, mm-hmm. with, with teens who have also had those thin slice judgments and all of those assorted issues with societal mm-hmm. views of them. And she also is, is a neurodivergent person herself. And so it, it's, we're all really working in tandem yeah. to provide that, the healing yeah. that, that the population Very needs. Very comprehensive mm-hmm. care. Yeah, that's pretty mm-hmm. cool. Wow, that's amazing. I, I did not know that was a thing. Right? Wow, okay, cool. Yep. It's And parents can find it everywhere. So yeah. if you're listening and you're not in California, yeah. There are tons of affirming practices all over the country, yeah. all over the world even. Yeah. And there is a guide, ndtherapist.com, that you can find a neurodivergent therapist anywhere in the country. Perfect. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at my list and thinking, is there anything we have not touched on? I think we talked quite a bit Ooh. about everything going on, it's, but yeah. just, you know, be learning, you know, yeah. be open. There is so much information out there. Yeah. Go on Instagram. There's a ton of resources. In fact, my friends, two of my friends who have an affirming practice here in LA are doing a podcast uh, live episode on Instagram today at 2.30. Oh, wow. So there's always something. There's yeah. a ton of information yes. out there. Parents want to find support. Yes. And I want to, that might be a good place to end on. How do we learn from autistic individuals learn from experience right what are some ways we can do that i know you just kind of mentioned well listen yeah yeah right, right. and go to professionals who are neurodivergent themselves yeah this is sure. one of those areas where i do i do believe lived experience is the best teacher mm. there are tons of neurodivergent therapists out there mm. who know this by living it right. and then also practice right so I, I believe that that's how you do it. Yeah. You know, you don't go to somebody who's never understood it or lived right. it. And and like you said, those Instagram accounts, they are really cool. Oh, there's so it's many a TikToks. Cool world. And I know. There, there's I know. tons of really yeah. great content out yeah, there. Yeah, absolutely. And so I do recommend taking a deep dive. There's some incredible parenting groups. Yeah. There, there really is a lot of resources. So yeah. don't feel alone. I think that's my biggest thing is don't feel alone. That's awesome. There's a lot of support. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I appreciate you so much. Thank you so oh, much Oh, thank for you, Taylor, for doing us. this. This is wonderful. <laughs> absolutely. Mm-hmm.